going to make a really shocking statement to you, so brace yourselves. Uh, I am not a mechanic, and I am not mechanically inclined. And that became a problem a couple of weeks ago when my truck was acting up, and it gave a code when the check engine light came on, and so I had the auto zone pull the code. They told me what the code was, and so I took it to the mechanic. I said, here's the code. Can you fix this for me? And the mechanic looked at me and said, no, just do it yourself, which is really odd when somebody says they don't want to get paid to do something. And I said, no, no, I'm, I'm not a mechanic. He said, oh, I promise you, you can do this. And I said, okay. And so I got on YouTube because if they show you how to do it on YouTube, in theory, you can do it. I went and bought the part and I started tearing apart my truck. And as I'm pulling off the intake, which if you don't know what that means, I didn't really either. I just know it takes in something. And as I pulled it off and I'm staring at my engine, I just said a prayer, Lord, Please help me to put this back together without breaking anything, whether it fixes it or not. But I, I replaced the gasket I needed to replace. I put the intake back on. I sealed it all back up. I shut the hood. I hopped in my truck. I turned the key, and it cranked up. I could not believe it. It actually cranked again, which it was running before, but it was just running really rough. And I thought, I wonder if this fixed it. And so I gave it a couple of seconds. And then it did exactly what it was doing long before I tore apart half of my truck. And so anyways, I'm not a mechanic and I don't understand much about combustible engines or whatever you call that. But here's what I do know. I do know about another engine in life, and that engine is hope because hope is the engine that makes your life go. There's been a lot of study on the concept of hope and what we've learned is that if you have hope, you have a future. You lose your hope you lose your will to live. And so if you get up tomorrow and you head off to work, it's because you have some type of hope. Maybe you're going to achieve a goal. Maybe there's going to be a certain payday in the near future. If you're motivated at all, it's because you have hope of accomplishing those dreams. There are things you want to get done this week or goals that you have in life that you work at and you have hope that you're going to accomplish those. And sometimes we even find ourselves a little worn down, maybe beaten down and really exhausted. And yet, you still have hope that things are going to get better, that this is going to pass, that there's going to be a change coming in the future. You see, hope is the engine that makes our lives go, and it plays such a drastic role in our life because it affects our life completely based on what we put our hope in. So if you put your hope in something like a relationship, you're pursuing this relationship, it's all you can focus on, and it's good until it's not. And then when you lose that relationship, you've lost your source of hope. Or maybe if you put your hope in your career and it's what you've always wanted to do and you think, man, if I can just do this, this is going to make my life complete and you get there. But what happens when you lose that job or one day you stop working and you lose a part of your identity and as a result, you lose your hope. Or maybe you've put your hope in your bank account or in your health or in politics, whatever it is, it absolutely affects the direction of our lives because hope is the engine that makes our lives go. So for the last month and a half, we've been in this series that we're calling The Essentials, where we've been looking at what are the core essentials of faith? Like, what do we have to know as followers of Jesus in order to be followers of Jesus? And not what do we have to know, but what do we have to agree upon? Like, what do we have to all say, yes, I agree with that statement? We all have the same framework because there are areas in Scripture where there are differences of interpretation or opinion, but there are certain things that are essential that are absolutely critical for us to understand as followers of Jesus. And these seven essentials are not just things we need to understand, but they're things that we need to be able to communicate. Because when somebody asks you, what do you believe? These are the things that we should be leading with because they're essential to our faith. And so with them, they're also mnemonic devices to help us easier to understand and to remember them. These have come from Dr. Scott Adair from Harding University. And so we've been repeating them every week. So just as a reminder, let's give that thumbs up. And let's say the phrase on the screen, I believe that Jesus is Lord. That's where it all starts for us as followers of Jesus. We believe that Jesus is Lord. He is reigning on high as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And then we have the one, hold up one finger, and let's repeat the phrase, I believe in one God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We talked about that concept of the Trinity and that index finger. If you look at it, you've got the two lines from your knuckles that creates those 
three sections as a reminder of the one God who we experience through Father, Son, and Spirit. And then we talked about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. So hold up that peace sign and let's repeat the phrase, I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And this is easy to remember because Jesus died, went into the valley of the shadow of death. He died and he was raised the third day. And these are so easy just to be able to share with somebody what you believe. And then the fourth one, if you point to your ring finger, Let's repeat the phrase, I believe the church is the bride of Christ. The church is not just a group of people that gathers together once or twice or three times a week. The church is his bride. It is the elect of God. The church is the chosen people of God who one day, as we'll talk about today, will live in forever union with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And he's longing for his bride to return home to him. It's a beautiful reminder. May we never take what we're doing and who we are for granted because you're part of the bride of Christ. All right, hold up that pinky finger. Let's repeat it. I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And we show the pinky finger because it's the weakest finger. You ever try to pick up something with your pinky? It's an incredibly difficult task if it's got a little bit of weight. And it's a reminder of how weak and fragile we are as God's people, that we are as sinners in need of the grace of God. And so the next one, hold out your palm. This is what we talked about last week. Let's repeat the phrase, I believed in the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about this powerful gift that God has given us, his very own own personal presence that brings about our transformation as we're being shaped more and more into the image of Jesus. And you can't do that on your own. And God never expected you to do that on on your own. Yes, you have the power of community, but you have the gift of his spirit who is placed within you so that you can live more and more like Jesus Christ. And then the seventh and final essential core element of the faith, take that palm and let's just hold it upright and let's repeat the phrase, I believe in the hope of resurrection and eternal life. And we're holding that hand up because we know that Jesus one day, as Mason read to us, is going to come in the clouds. And it's this reminder that our hope is in the resurrection and eternal life. So I want to go ahead and give you my big idea for the morning that we're going to unpack. For those of you that like to know where we're headed as a message, I've had people say, and even recently, like, I didn't know where you were headed, but man, you brought it back around and it was good. And that's just how and work sometimes. Let me tell you where we're going so that in case I take the long way around, you know where our ultimate destination is going to be. The hope of the resurrection and life everlasting is the foundation of the Christian hope, of our courage, and of the ordering of the Christian life. So I want to take our time this morning and unpack what that phrase means because it's absolutely critical for us to understand as we close out this series, the role that not only our future resurrection in Christ Jesus, but life everlasting, what it means for us. So let's start with that first phrase, the foundation of the Christian hope. So what I want you to think about this morning is that the hope of resurrection is not the hope of resuscitation. Do you remember that story in John chapter 11 about that guy named Lazarus? You remember Lazarus? He was a close friend of Jesus, and at some point he became sick, and that sickness led about to him passing away. And Jesus learns that he's sick, that he's near death. And so Jesus does something really strange. He stays put. He could have traveled to go heal Lazarus, but he hung out a little while longer. And he allowed Lazarus to pass away. And he waits four days after Lazarus has died before he shows up. And there he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And just think about what that would be like if you're Lazarus, okay? So you've been sick, your life has come to an end, your spirit has separated from your body, they've laid your body in the tomb, your spirit has returned to God, and there you are, you have passed on into the beginnings of the afterlife, and it's only been a couple of days, or if you're in eternity, I guess maybe even just a couple of minutes, and you're there, and at some point, somebody comes to you and says, hey, Lazarus, this is really strange. In fact, it doesn't happen hardly at all, but you're going to to go back. What do you mean I'm going to have to go back? Like you're going to have to go back to the earth. Jesus is going to raise you from the dead. I got to go back. Yep, you got to go back. Well, is that at least going to fix the back pain I was having before? No, Lazarus, you just you're not being resurrected. You're just being resuscitated. He's going to bring you back to life. Same back pain, same bad knees that need to be replaced. I'm really sorry, but you got to hurry up like he's calling your name right now. Well, hold on, hold on. Before I go, does that mean I'm not going to have to die again? Yeah, I'm sorry. 
Yeah, you're going to have to go through that process one more time, but, you know, you'll get the double blessing. I don't know what that had to have been like, but when Lazarus came back, he wasn't resurrected like Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 15. He was resuscitated. He was brought back to life. Whatever ailments, aside from the sickness he was healed from, whatever physical ailments Lazarus had, he had when he came back from the dead. He was not like Jesus, who we get a glimpse of, say, in Luke chapter 24 in his resurrected body. Paul takes an entire chapter to address this concept of what it means to be raised from the dead and of our hope. And this is the foundation of our hope. We're not going to read all of 1 Corinthians 15, though I would encourage you to do that. I just want to look at a couple of verses real quick. In verses 42 through 44, he's talking about this resurrection body because he wants us to understand understand that when we're raised from the dead, we're not just going to be these spirits floating around. There is a resurrection body that is going to be raised, that we are going to be given. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 42, so it is with the resurrection of the dead, sown in corruption, raised in incorruption, sown in dishonor, raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown a natural body, raised a spiritual body. And he wants us to understand that death, as he's going to talk about at the end of the chapter, is the final enemy to be destroyed. And the reason why death is the final enemy is because death is the undoing of God's creation. When God created humankind in Genesis chapter 2, he created the man with a body and he placed his spirit within him. It was the breath of life that was placed within him. And when your life comes to an end, your body returns to the ground and your spirit returns to God. It's the undoing of God creation. And in the ultimate resurrection, what is our hope is that one day we will be reunited in a resurrection body. What does that mean? Man, there's a lot of questions and a lot of ideas as to exactly what that will look like and what that will be. But Paul gives a window into the eternity and he lets us know that this body we will inhabit is not completely like the body that we're inhabiting now. Yet it'll be some type of body, but it's going to be incorruptible, meaning there's not going to be anything that's going to break your body down. No more diseases that's going to wear you down and break you down. No more dishonor. It's going to be completely glorious, just like God is glorious. It's not going to be weak. And so when you get up, and some of us, when we get up, I joked about it a couple weeks ago, all of a sudden I started bending over, and as I bent over, I groaned, and I don't know what happened. I don't know when it happened. Now every time I bend over, I just groan, and it's not like things are hurting. It just naturally comes out. I guess it's a prelude of what's going to happen at some point when the pain begins from bending over, but it's just this reminder that our bodies are weak. And regardless of how much you can bench press or pick up, there is still weakness within your body because there are things that break us down. And there's a certain point in life where our bodies stop growing and they start breaking down, don't they? And where they were once as strong as they were, they're progressively getting weaker and weaker. And then there are things like sicknesses and ailments that just show all of us, regardless of our age, how weak the human body actually is. And it's sown, it's placed in the ground in weakness, but it's going to be raised powerful. Meaning, as we'll look at in just a minute, those sicknesses no longer touch you. You're not plagued by any of those cancer cells, any of those joint pains. It's raised in power. And it's sown natural, meaning physical, fleshly, and it's raised to be a spiritual body. It's raised to be fully sanctified, no longer struggling with the temptations of sin. Doesn't that sound awesome? No, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to fly or pick up cars. It just means that all of the things that are plaguing us today are removed. That's what John's going to talk about in Revelation 21, where he gets this vision of what the new Jerusalem, the heaven is going to look like, what our eternal future is going to hold. He says, I saw this new heaven and a new earth because, well, the first heaven and the first earth had passed away in the sea. It was no more too. He's referencing back to the creation in Genesis 1. There's going to be something new 
that's coming. And he describes it as this holy city. In Genesis 1 and 2, it was a garden, but now it's going to be this city, this new Jerusalem. He's tying the entire story of the Bible together. And it's coming down out of heaven from God, and it's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. It's beautiful, it's radiant, it's glorious, and it should be something that we're anticipating, something that we're longing for, that we're placing our hope in. And then he said, I heard this loud voice from the throne, look, God is dwelling with humans again. All the way back in the beginning in Genesis, God dwelled with the man and the woman, but because of their sin, they were separated from God, but it's not going to be like that forever. In fact, forever, the way it's going to be is God's going to be with his creation. They will be his people, and he will be with them and will be their God. And then he says he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more, praise God. There will be no more grief or crying or pain because all those things have passed away. They've been removed. And the one seated on the throne said, look, I am making everything new. That word new is really interesting. It doesn't mean like brand new as, as like never been seen, but, re, but new as in like renewed, made right. He's going to put everything back to the way it was supposed to be. And then he said, write this down because these are faithful and true. That's the Bible's way of saying it's a guarantee. You can take it to the bank. It is going to happen. We're just waiting on when. And then he said to me, it's done. You ever painted a room or you painted your house and you hit that last swipe of the roller or of the brush? Or maybe you were cutting your grass and you hit that last little bit and maybe you even bagged up the clippings and you looked at it and you said, it's done. Or you're working on a different project and you built something and there you got done and you said, it is done. And you looked and you sat back and you said, it's finished. It's complete. That's what God said. What is going to come is already done in the mind of God. It's happening, folks. We need to do our best to get ready for it. This is our hope. Our hope is that regardless of what happens in this life, regardless of what happens inside of your own human body, regardless of whether or not your life comes to an end before Jesus returns, our hope is in an eternal future that is far greater than the one we are currently experiencing. Our hope is in the fact that one day sin will be removed, that we will be raised to a resurrection body that is not plagued with the illnesses and diseases that we experience, no longer having the pains in this life. And we will live with God forever in his presence. That is the foundation of our hope. And it's something we need to be regularly reminding one another of because it's the foundation of our courage. So some of you guys went back to school this week and your parents were like, praise the Lord, finally, I couldn't wait. And you guys went back to, many of us went back to work or you went back to, you're going to go back to work tomorrow and you're kind of getting back into that routine. Some of you guys are going to leave today and you're going to go back to a home or you're the only one that's following Jesus. We're all going to walk out of this building and we're going to enter back in to a post-Christian society, one that does not live by the ideals that are found within scripture. And we're all going to experience some type of tension this week in our world if we're living right, where we're going to be challenged in some capacity as faithful children of God. There's going to be something that we witness. There's going to be a conversation that we have. There's going to be a tension that we feel that what I believe and what I am trying to live out does not match the culture that I live in. And you're going to be tempted to do one of two things when you experience that tension. You're either going to blend in or you're going to stand firm for your convictions. Those are your only two choices. You will either blend into the culture that is around you or you will stand firm on the ideals of Scripture. Those are your two choices. Now, the choice that you make is based upon the foundation of your hope. You see, if your hope is in being popular, if your hope is in fitting in and being socially accepted, then that's the choice that you'll make. If your hope is found in life everlasting, then you will stand firm. The thing that we all need to remember is we need to learn to live with the 10,000 year view. It goes like this, 10,000 years from now, what's going to matter? Well, one, none of us will be here. I mean, not even close, none of us will be here. 10,000 years from now, what will matter? Will it matter that you, that you fit in? Will it matter that you were the most popular? 
Will it matter that you were the coolest? Will it matter that you were the parent that was the coolest parent? Will it, will it matter that you were the, the boss who was the, the uh, strictest, the one who got the most productivity? Will it matter that you had the nicest home, the nicest car, that you had the most money in the bank account? Will any of that stuff matter? No, the only thing that will matter is whether or not you are faithful to King Jesus. That's all that will matter. Everything else will take a back seat. And every other relationship will hopefully fit into that paradigm. Am I being faithful to King Jesus? And so when you walk into the, school, the halls of school tomorrow, what's going to matter 10,000 years from now is whether or not you were faithful to King Jesus as a student. If you're a teacher and you walk back into your classroom and the way that you interact with your students will matter 10,000 years from now, whether or not you are a faithful servant and steward of King Jesus with that influence. If you're going to go and you're going to manage some people or you're going to have, you're going to spend some time and interact with your coworkers, the thing that will matter 10,000 years from now is whether or not you're a faithful servant of Jesus. You're parenting kids and you're trying to figure out how do I give them what they need and maybe even God willing a little bit of what they want. Who knows what's going to matter as a parent, whether or not I've raised my children to be faithful servants of King Jesus. When you're getting ready to make the purchase, take the job, going to the bank, whatever it is God is leading you to do, the one thing that will matter is whether or not you're a faithful servant of King Jesus. That's why at the end of 1 Corinthians 15, after this entire conversation about our hope of being raised to new life one day, of taking on this resurrection body, that's why Paul said these words. He said, therefore, this entire conversation he's been having, this is the gospel, and because of the gospel, this is our hope. And we have a hope that just like Jesus was raised, we're going to be raised too. That's the, the foundation of our hope. That's what we stand on. That's what we're living out every day. Therefore, because of that reality, if this is what you believe, if this is the foundation of your hope, man, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Do what is right, because it's always the right time to do do the right thing. When you're being tempted to do wrong, do what is right. Why? Because you have a hope that is beyond this life. Stand firm. Don't let anything move you. Don't let the opinions of other people move you. It doesn't matter. Don't let the opinions of people that are not internally invested in your life sway you. Seek the approval of the one true God who is pleased and who loves you. That's whose approval that you that you're seeking. Let nothing move you. Nothing in the world can take you away from the love of Christ Jesus. Nothing can move you unless you allow it to. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Whatever God calls you to do, he will lead you through it. He will give you what you need. Go where he sends you. Speak when he nudges you. Love always. Give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Whether you're going to school as a student, as a parent, whether you're going as a teacher, as a grandparent, whether you're going back to work, whether you're retired, whatever it is that God is calling you to do, use that in working for the Lord. Every day, give yourself fully to doing God's will and to bringing him glory because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. When you're doing something for God, it's never a waste of your time. Now, don't get me wrong. You may not spark revival. You may not have your entire neighborhood break out in revival. Your entire class may not bust out in revival this year, but you have no idea the impact you're making in the life of one person. And if all of us impacts one person, you're making an, an eternal impact in that person's life. And it's never in vain. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful. It's the laborers that are, that are few. Your labor's not in vain. You may be thinking, man, I've been trying, I've been praying, I've been trying to be a good source of encouragement, I've been trying to be a light. It's not in vain. You may not see the benefits of what you're doing in this life because when you sow something, it takes time to bring about a harvest. You may never know the influence that you're having, the good that you're doing, but you can rest assured it's not in vain because no work in the Lord is in vain. It's the foundation of our courage. This is why believers all across the world today who are even persecuted for their faith are willing to stand and allow their lives to be taken and will not renounce the name of Jesus. It's the source of our courage because even if you take my life away, you cannot take my eternal life away. 
I have something far greater than this world can offer, and I will not renounce the name of my Savior. It's the foundation of our courage. And so when you feel that tension in your life this week, stand firm. You've got a far greater reality coming. Your hope is not in this life. It's in the next. And finally, it's the foundation of the ordering of the Christian life. Over and over in the Bible, it talks about this concept of holiness. And it's a word that means to be set apart. It means to be uh, set apart for God's special purposes. It really means to be distinct. It means to be different. It means, and this is what we talked about last week, if the Spirit of God lives in you, there should be something different about you than there is about the person in whom the Spirit of God does not dwell. And what is different? The difference is called holiness. And what's interesting, especially in the text that Mason read to us, is that when Paul is talking about this reminder that Jesus is going to return, what he has just got done talking about is holiness. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he said God's will is for you is to be holy, that each one of you would control his own body and live in holiness and honor, not in the lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and do not know his ways. Now, we live in a microwave society, right? We're all in this battle of instant gratification versus delayed gratification? And has there ever been a time where you were going to put something in the microwave and you flip it over to see how long it's going to take and you're like, three minutes? Are you kidding me? That's such a long time. I'm starving. I'm ready to eat now. We're even in a microwave society. Things aren't fast enough. But we're all trying to figure out and learn to tell ourselves no. And we're doing that in a culture that is telling you to never tell yourself no. Culture's message is it's your life. Do what you want. Whatever you desire, do it. Live it out. Whatever you feel, whatever your heart says, whatever your desires say, just do it. It'll be awesome. And it won't be because it's a lie. It's an illusion from the enemy himself. The message of Scripture is, in, is in fact, exactly the opposite. The message of Scripture is learn to control your desires because your desires lie to you. Your heart lies to you, does it not? If your heart has ever lied to you, just raise your hand this morning. Every adult should have their hand up now because for all of us, at some point, our heart lied to us. Your heart told you you wanted something that would have been the worst thing in the world for you, but you didn't know it at the time because the heart lies. In fact, no one has lied to you more than your heart has lied to you. So maybe let's be a little gracious next time somebody lies to us because you've lied to you more than they have lied to you. And we're all learning to control our passions. And it's a challenge, isn't it? It's, it's warfare is what the Bible describes it as. We're in this battle where we're trying to tell ourselves no. And praise be to God, he's given us the spirit to fight the battle. And we're trying to control our bodies. And in the same conversation about holiness, Paul says, here's a word from the Lord. You know, we who are alive at the Lord's coming will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Fallen asleep, those who have already passed on. Because the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. That phrase, a shout, an archangel's voice, and the trumpet of God, that's maybe not something that we fully understand because we don't live in that kind of society. But whenever a, an army went out to battle and they came back and the king came back victorious and he got ready to enter into the city, the entire city would come out because somebody had already run into the city ahead and had shouted, the king is coming, the king is coming, we are victorious. And they would go out and they would this parade to welcome the king back home and it would include these trumpets and all the people and the language that Paul is giving is if we're alive when Jesus returns there's going to be a shout at the coming of the king there's going to be a trumpet blast to say our king is victorious and here he comes and if we're alive and we are left then we're going to get caught up together with them in the clouds and we're going to meet the Lord in the air just like they would have exited the city gates and gone out to meet the coming of the king if we're still on this earth then we're going to be caught up in the air and we're going to meet King Jesus as he's coming back down out of the clouds and we're going to celebrate the return of our Lord and that's when Paul says we're going to be changed in a moment in 1 Corinthians 15 in the twinkling of an eye where we're going to be sown 
incorruptible, raised to an incorruptible life. And if our life has already come to the end, our body has gone back to the ground, our spirit has gone back to God, that is when we will experience that reunification, when we will be raised from the dead. And we will always be with the Lord. In a conversation about holiness, Paul says, remember, Jesus is coming back. So when you're battling sin this week, when you're battling one of those desires that's crept up in your heart, and you're waging spiritual warfare, fighting it off, Paul says, encourage one another with these words. When somebody comes forward, somebody confesses sin, somebody comes to you and says, hey, I've really been struggling. I need you to pray for me. I've really been struggling. Here's the sin I'm dealing with. The Bible says we should forgive, we should pray, and we should encourage them that Jesus is returning. It's not always going to be like this, folks. We're not always going to be in this battle with sin and holiness. When Jesus returns, we'll be fully sanctified. And those sinful desires will be gone because we will always be in the presence of the Lord. This is the ordering of the Christian life. This is the why behind the why. Why are you showing up to a building once or twice or three times a week? Why are you living in spiritual community? Why are you trying to tell yourself no? Why are you not doing what others are doing that are in the world? Why are you not just giving in to all of your desires? Because Jesus is going to return. And when we're worn down, when we're beat down, the Bible says encourage one another. And there's this word that you find in the scriptures. And in fact, you see it right at the end of the Bible itself at the end of John's revelation it was a word that these early Christians used to remind one another of what Paul talks about of this returning of the king and the word was Maranatha and it's got some different translations but ideally it means our Lord come or our Lord is coming or our Lord has come you can take your pick but it means our Lord come Maranatha Jesus is coming and it's a reminder that Paul says we should be giving one another regularly. And I don't know if this is something that we're doing, to be honest with you. I don't know that I've done it enough and need to do it more. We need to regularly remind ourselves the Lord is coming. Have you had some Maranatha days? Some days where the events of that day or of that week or of that year has made you pray more than you ever had. Lord, come quickly, please. Please come now. I'm tired. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm struggling. I'm broken. Jesus, just come back now. There are days that are Maranatha days. And then there are seasons, if we're honest, where we're like, Jesus, you can wait another day or two. I'm going pretty good right now. Shame on us. Shame on us. Because what is coming is far greater than anything we could ever imagine. And we're longing to see King Jesus, and to be in his presence for all of eternity. And so, church, Maranatha, our Lord, come. It could be today. And if today is the day that Jesus returns, praise God. Maranatha, we will always be with the Lord. My question for you is simply, if today is the day that Jesus is returning, are you ready? Are you ready to see the King? The Bible is very clear. Jesus is returning. The question for us is are we ready to see him? The beautiful thing is we offer an invitation every week. And let me just tell you, the invitation is always open. Whether we sing a quote-unquote invitation song or not, our goal as a church family is transformation and change. If there's something on your heart, whether it's a Sunday morning at the close of a service, whether it's a Tuesday night at 8 p.m., whether it's a Friday night at 3 a.m. It does not matter. The invitation is open. And if God is calling you to repent, then please, by the grace of God, repent and call someone and get prayer. And this morning, we have an opportunity to make sure our lives are ready for the coming of the King. I pray it's today. I don't want to live another day without seeing King Jesus.
I don't know about you, I'd be good with it being today. And it's not because life has been bad or hard or incredibly difficult. I'm ready to see the king. And if it's not today, I'll see him in other ways. I see him in you all the time. And we need to see Jesus every day in some capacity. And we need to stand firm. We need to live the love that he's called us to have every day as we faithfully wait for the return of our king. And if he doesn't return in our lifetime, we will go to our grave with the hope, not the wishful thought, but the guaranteed confident expectation that we will be reunited with him for all of eternity. Today, if you don't have that hope, it's incredibly simple. Just repent of your sin, confess his name, and be baptized into Christ. Oh, don't get me wrong. It's very challenging. You're beginning a walk with Christ that will take everything that you have. But praise God, he didn't leave it all on you. He's going to give you his spirit so that you can live this life faithfully, walking with the king every day. And one day, church, one day, we will see the king. And the church, as the bride of Christ, will be reunited with the Savior. And thus, we shall always be with the Lord. Let's encourage one another with that thought. On a regular basis, I pray that we will tell one another, Maranatha, Jesus is coming. Lord, come quickly. If there's anything we can do for you this morning, you want to give your life to Christ, you want to repent of sin, you just need prayer and encouragement, life's wearing you down, you're struggling in your battle of holiness, whatever it is that we can encourage you, we want to encourage one another as we uh, eagerly anticipate the return of our King. Let's stand together and sing.